Hi, so in our last video, we discussed how we model atoms. Now, let's look into how we apply these models to catalysts. But why are we talking about catalysts? You know, why are they even important? So let's begin by motivating why catalysts are important, what catalysts actually are, and then we'll discuss how we model them. So let's review why we care about catalysts. One of the big reasons is climate change. As we all know, we need to use more renewable energy. The good news is, the amount of solar and wind generation has been increasing pretty dramatically over the last 10 years. However, by 2050, the IEA predicts that we need to have at least six times this amount to reach net zero. Now, this might seem fairly feasible, you know, if that was all there was, but there's a catch to this. So let's look at an average day in California. Here is the energy demand. What you see is that the energy demand is the lowest around noon and then peaks when everybody goes home and turns on the AC and TVs. Now let's look at the solar and wind generation at the same time. We see solar generation kind of peaks around noon, which is not surprising, and the wind generation is fairly constant. If we build three times the amount of solar and wind generation, what happens? Well, we get this. And two really obvious problems pop out. The first is around noon, we have way too much electricity. And then in the evening, when everybody turns on their TVs and turns on the air conditioners, we don't have enough electricity to go around. So what we need to be able to do is figure out how to transfer that electricity from around noon when it's in excess to the evening when people need it. And it's not just for transferring energy from one day, uh, you know, one time of the day to another. You can imagine we could have multiple cloudy days or, you know, a cloudier season and we want to transfer energy not just for hours but for days or weeks or months. So one way to do this is to take the excess renewable energy and use that to split water in a process called electrolysis into hydrogen and oxygen. We can then store the hydrogen and later when we need additional energy we can use that hydrogen in a fuel cell to generate electricity. The problem with this is that the chemical reactions involved in the electrolysis and the fuel cells is just too expensive. So now you might be thinking to yourself, well, if hydrogen is too expensive, why don't you just use batteries? This is a question I get a lot. So give me some patience here. I'm gonna go off on a tangent and tell you why batteries sometimes are good, but sometimes aren't. So batteries work really simply. They just take the renewable energy, they store it, and when you need electricity, you just take the electricity back out. One thing to know about batteries is that the round trip efficiency of the electricity is about 90%. So you only get 90% of what you put in. Now, if we look at hydrogen generation, it's a bit more complex. Where we have the electrolysis, we have gas storage, and then we use a fuel cell to generate the electricity. And the round trip efficiency of this cycle is only 40%. So again, it looks like batteries are going to win out. The reason why batteries aren't always the right solution is what if you need to store a lot of electricity? What if you need to store not just a few hours of electricity, but days or months of electricity? Well then, you need to build more and more batteries. It doesn't scale well with the amount of electricity that you need to store. However, for hydrogen, the storage is really, really cheap. You just have to build more you know, steel tanks to store the hydrogen in. So hydrogen is expensive in the transition, but it is cheap in the storage. Batteries are super cheap in the transition, but are expensive in the storage. So each one has its own trade-offs and each are good for different scenarios. Another thing to know is that hydrogen is useful for a lot of applications for which batteries are ill-suited, such as airplanes or making steel. Okay, so let's go back to how we can make hydrogen less expensive. So there's two chemical reactions, electrolysis and fuel cell. The first one, electrolysis, takes electricity and water in and produces oxygen and hydrogen. And you can see the chemical reaction here. The fuel cell does the opposite reaction, where it takes oxygen and hydrogen in and produces electricity and water. So what we want to do is drive these reactions as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. How do we compute the expected reaction rate? For this, we use something called the rate equation. The rate equation takes as input the concentration of the reactants, which, for example, could be hydrogen and oxygen. Note, one way to increase the concentration is to increase the pressure, and this will in turn increase the overall reaction rate. Each concentration also has a partial order of reaction. These exponents tell us how the reaction rate varies based on the concentration. For instance, if the order is zero, the reaction rate isn't going to vary at all based on the concentration, where if it's one, it's going to vary linearly. Though the order can have fractional values and can be larger than one. 
These values are experimentally determined for each reaction and can be assumed to be fixed and known. Finally, we have the reaction rate constant k. Now I know it's a bit confusing, but k is actually not constant. It's a function of several variables, and it's k that we're going to try to increase to improve our overall reaction rate. So what is k, and how do we compute it? The rate constant k is a frequency for which collisions between atoms result in a reaction, and it's computed using the Arrhenius equation. So what's on the right-hand side of the equation? Well, there's several variables that are constants, and we're just going to ignore those for now. And then we have T, which is the temperature, and we have Ea, which is the activation energy. So let's look at how K varies as a function of T or as a function of the activation energy. So as you can see here, as we increase the temperature, the rate constant K goes up. This shouldn't be surprising. As we heat the system, the atoms move around faster. The faster they're moving, the more likely they are to run into each other and undergo a reaction. So this is one way to speed up a chemical reaction. The problem is that temperature equals money. The higher you need to raise the temperature, the more energy you need to put into the system, and the more expensive the reaction is. Now let's look at the activation energy, which is a minimum amount of energy you need to put into the system for the reaction to occur. As you increase the activation energy, it's not surprising that the reaction rate decreases. So what we want to do is reduce the activation energy as much as possible. And how do we reduce the activation energy? Well, we use something called a catalyst. So a catalyst is a material used to increase the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. Let's look at a specific example to gain some intuition for how a catalyst is actually used and how they work. Here we have the Toyota Mirai, which is a hydrogen-powered car. So it takes hydrogen as fuel and then produces the electricity and water as output. So underneath the Mirai's hood is a fuel cell, and in the fuel cell there's both an anode and a cathode. And on the cathode, there's a very simple chemical reaction that occurs. You basically have an oxygen molecule, and you combine it with four protons, or you know, hydrogens without the electrons, to then create electricity and water. Now if we look at this chemical reaction, we have a set of reactants, which are the inputs to the chemical reaction. That's the oxygen and the hydrogen. And then we have a set of products, and that's the output of the chemical reaction, and that's water. And if we look at the energy difference between the reactants and the products, we see that the energy goes down. So intuitively, we think this chemical reaction would just happen, because everything wants to go to a lower energy state. But in practice, this doesn't happen. Why is this? Well, if we look at the chemical reaction, we have those two oxygen atoms, and they're really tightly bonded together. They like being an oxygen molecule. So in order for this chemical reaction to proceed, we have to figure out a way to break that oxygen molecule, so that way those two oxygen atoms can break apart and form the water molecules. And this is why we have reactivation energy. It's how much energy do we need to put into the system to break that oxygen molecule apart. So how would a catalyst help reduce the activation energy for this chemical reaction? Well, here's an illustration where we have an oxygen molecule, which we call the absorbate, and we have a platinum catalyst down below. So when the oxygen molecule comes in contact with the platinum catalyst, the bond between the two oxygen atoms weakens because one of the oxygen atoms is being attracted to that platinum catalyst. And because that bond decreases, it's easier when the two hydrogens come in to then break apart or pull apart the oxygen molecule. And similarly, the bond between the platinum and the oxygen for the remaining oxygen atom is easy to pull off when two hydrogen atoms come into contact with it. So going back to our earlier illustration, we have the oxygen molecule, and when it's in the presence of a catalyst, it weakens the bond between the two oxygen atoms. This in turn reduces the activation energy, which allows us to proceed with the chemical reaction using less energy, and less energy means less money. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, how do we compute that activation energy given the catalyst? Well, we're actually not going to talk about that today, because computing the activation energy is actually pretty complex. It's a, a tough thing. Maybe we'll do that in a future video. Today, we're going to instead talk about something called the absorption energy. And the absorption energy, you can think of it as kind of a nice rough approximation of the activation energy. So let's dive into what the absorption energy is. So the absorption energy is a measure of how strongly the absorbate, and remember, the absorbate is a molecule in the chemical reaction, is attracted to the catalyst. And we compute the absorption energy by taking the energy of the overall system when the absorbate is in contact with the catalyst, and we subtract off the energy of the catalyst by itself 
and the absorbate by itself when it's in the gas phase. Thus, you can view the absorption energy as a change in energy when the absorbate comes in contact with the catalyst. Note, a lower absorption energy indicates that the absorbate is more strongly attracted to the catalyst. One thing to know about absorption energies is they need to be just right. If your absorption energy is too strong, if it attracts that absorbate really strongly to the catalyst surface, what's going to happen is the absorbate is just going to be sitting and filling up the entire catalyst surface, and you're basically going to grind the reaction to a halt. Because the activation energy to pull, let's say, those oxygen atoms back off the catalyst surface is going to be too high. Alternatively, the absorption energy could be too weak. In this case, it's not going to have much impact on the chemical reaction because it's not going to be pulling the absorbate into contact with the catalyst surface. So what we need is a catalyst which is just right, just in the middle, where it's not too weak, not too strong. Now unfortunately, for many of the chemical reactions that we're interested in, especially for these climate change applications that we're talking about, the catalysts that work really well are expensive. It's platinum, iridium, other really expensive metals. So what we need to do is find cheaper catalysts. Now to illustrate this Goldilocks type effect, Let's look at a simple plot, which is typically referred to as a volcano plot because, well, it kind of looks like a volcano. We have the absorption energy on the x-axis, and we have the overall activity of the chemical reaction on the y-axis. And now if the absorption energy is lower, that means it's attracting that absorbate much more strongly. And we can see when that happens, the reaction rate decreases. Similarly, if the absorption energy is too weak, we see, again, that it doesn't have much impact on the chemical reaction, and the reaction rate is smaller. However, if we get the absorption energy just right, then we see that the overall reaction rate is optimized. And again, in this case, platinum works really well. So what are the different types of catalyst materials? Well, we can have simple metals, you know, just a catalyst made up of a single element. We can have multimetallics, which you can think of as kind of random mixtures of different metals. Then there's intermetallics, which are pretty interesting because they are ordered structures, kind of crystal structures of different metals put together. Uh, you can have something called an overlayer, which is, you know, as its name implies, you basically just have a different metal on top of the catalyst on its surface. And then you can have high entropy catalysts. And these, think of these as just catalysts which have many different types of elements within them. Now, beyond just the material, we also have to consider, you know, which surface are you going to use? So let's say you have a bulk material like the one seen here. When you're creating a catalyst, you need to pick out which surface you're going to use. Well, you could pick the front, you could pick the side, or you can even slice it down the middle, or you can slice it down the middle this way. And when you do the slice, you can slice it at a couple different places, even at the same orientation. Now, typically, when people are talking about you know, which surface you're using, they use something called a Miller index. And the Miller index essentially tells you the angle that you cut the material to create your surface. Now that we have the surface of the catalyst, how do we actually model it? We can think of a catalyst as being a 2D surface. And here we're just showing a 1D slice of it. Now, instead of modeling a catalyst as like one really big surface, what we do is we instead break it up into a unit cell. And that unit cell, we assume, is basically repeated infinitely both in the x and the y directions. We can then put an absorbate in that unit cell, and it, as well, is going to be repeated in the x and y directions. Now, within a catalyst, we're going to assume that only the atoms on the surface of the catalyst are actually going to move. So the atoms that are lower in the catalyst, we're going to assume that those are fixed. And then the top few layers of atoms, we're going to assume that those are free along with the absorbate. So it's only the free atoms that we're going to be moving during our simulations. When we run our simulations, we also have to take into account the atoms in the neighboring cells. And we compute the positions of the atoms in the neighboring cells by computing an offset. We get the offset for atoms in a neighboring cell by using a matrix M, which is a 3 by 3 matrix, multiplied by the unit cell's coordinates. Now one thing that's important to know is that M can model any affine transformation. So we can scale the unit cell to make it bigger, we can change its aspect ratio, or we can even skew the unit cell. We then use M to tile the unit cell to create a catalyst surface over the x and y directions. Okay, so now that we know how we actually model a catalyst, how do we compute the absorption energy? So again, the absorption energy is computed by calculating the energy of the absorbate on the catalyst surface, minus the energy of the catalyst by itself, minus the energy of the absorbate in the gas phase by itself. The energy of the catalyst by itself and the energy of the absorbate are generally known beforehand, or they're fairly easy to compute. So let's talk about how we compute the energy of the absorbate on top of the catalyst, because that's the trickiest part. To do this, 
we pick an arbitrary initial state where we basically displace the absorbate somewhere on top of the catalyst, and then we perform a relaxation, like we discussed in the previous video. We compute the forces on the atoms, we then update the atom positions, we compute the forces again, and we keep repeating this process over and over and over again until the forces go to zero, which is equivalent to hitting a local energy minimum. And the positions of the atoms at this local energy minimum is called a relaxed state. So what do these relaxations look like in practice? Here's a pretty interesting example with an absorbate that's fairly complex. And we see when we do a relaxation with density functional theory or DFT, we get a relaxation that looks like this. You know, the absorbate's moving around quite a bit. It's, it's a, actually a fairly complex simulation. And here's the same thing done with a machine learning model. And what's really interesting is how well these work. And we'll get more into how machine learning models are used in the next video. So if we plot the energy as the relaxation proceeds, we see that the energy slowly decreases. So while the DFT and machine learning approaches get to the same end result, the pathways do vary. Now take note, I'm just showing you a positive example where the machine learning approach works here. It's not always the case. A lot of times the machine learning approach will also fail. Every time we perform a relaxation, we are finding a local energy minimum. However, what we really want is a global energy minimum because in the real world, the absorbate will be attracted to the site with the lowest energy. So typically, we need to perform numerous relaxations to find the one that has the lowest global energy. So putting this value back into our equation, we can basically take our global energy minimum that we found, negative 2.43 EVs. We can also compute the catalyst energy and the absorbate energy, and then we can get our funnel absorption energy. In our made-up example here, it's negative 0.53 EV. We can take this point and put it into a hypothetical volcano plot, and we can see that this particular point is a little bit too strong. We want to find a catalyst that has a weaker absorption energy. Now the volcano plot that I was just showing, it's overly simplified. Usually you don't just have a single absorbate that you're interested in, and usually it's not this like perfect kind of volcano shape. Many times in real reactions, you're going to be looking at multiple different absorbates, multiple different absorption energies, and the plots themselves are going to be a little bit more complex. They're not going to be like these simple volcanoes. Now finally, it's important to note that the models that we're using right here are really approximate. They're really simplistic models. We just have this perfectly clean catalyst with a single absorbate sitting on top. It's a really simple model. Now in a real world chemical reaction, it's going to be a lot more complex. The catalyst itself isn't going to be a perfect crystal structure. It's going to have imperfections in it. Uh, the surface of the catalyst could you know, have different atoms sitting in different places. It might not be a nice clean surface. You could have multiple absorbates in the chemical reaction all interacting with each other. And typically, the absorbates aren't just sitting there floating around in air. They're actually floating in a solvent like water. So you have to model the water molecules that are floating around as well. But even though the chemical reactions you know, are a lot more complex and they have all these different things going on, even modeling this simple case a lot of times can be informative of the trends of the chemical reaction. It can tell you which catalysts are likely to be useful if we actually try them out experimentally. All right, that's it for this video. We discussed why catalysts are important, what they are, and then how we model them. Next up, we're gonna dive into machine learning and how we actually model the atoms themselves. So what we wanna do is approximate DFT, compute the energies and forces using neural networks, using deep learning, and we'll get into all of that in our next video. Check it out.